you speak in your book about uh, issues that this present system claims to have uh, resolved uh, that are not resolved. Can you give us some examples? Just turn to any of the great aching questions of life and experience, and you'll find something about which science has nothing to say. Why is the universe here? What is the nature of a biological organism? What is life? Why are we uh, confronted by the very, very odd, non-generic, non-typical nature of biological structure and processes? What is the nature of speciation? What is the origin of life? What is the destiny of life? Perfectly reasonable question. Why is life here? What is its destiny? Only a scientist involved in molecular biology would think to deny the reasonable reasonableness of that question. What is the nature of reality? Is there such a thing as reality? What is the nature of the universe? Have we made any progress in understanding the origins of the universe? What is the end of the universe? What is the nature of the universe? What is human reason? What is human purpose? What is love? What role does it play in the cosmos? None of these questions do we have a clue. Darwin has claimed that they've solved the issue of love. You nod sagely. What can you say? <laughs> Except in the words of Schiller, gegen die Dummheit kämpfen selbst Götter vergeblich, which means against such stupidity even the gods are helpless. Okay. What can you say? I've solved the nature of love. Yeah, good luck. Well, they're, they're about to solve with a big grant uh, to, to some researchers in, in uh, England uh, the, the, uh, the human belief in God that it, it's a function of evolution. Everything is a function of evolution. Except belief in evolutionary theory. That's exempt. Yeah. A curious exemption, wouldn't you say? <laughs> this, is a stand, this is a standard in philosophy, isn't it? That, uh, Your beliefs are contrived I, and determined, mine are not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I believe that with respect to you, for example. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. in my case, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but you really have to ask yourself, excuse me for interrupting, no, no. you have to ask yourself, what happened to this elementary power of looking in the mirror and testing your own impression in the mirror by these obvious standards. If you say the other guy couldn't be right because he has a gene for believing in God, what is stopping you from looking in the mirror and saying, hey, maybe I have a gene for believing what I believe, and if I do, what good is my view? I can't help believing what I do. And if I don't, why am I supposing this guy has? This is, this is a, a, a thought that needs a, a, a label, and that I see in politics all the time. Namely, if this argument is sound, uh, would it be sound if you put the shoe on the other foot? Yeah, and nobody ever says that. Look, I have to be honest, I don't say it a whole lot myself. No, I know. It's, 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 it's not natural. I mean, it's, it's not the it's first, it's difficult. not part of human nature, whatever human nature difficult. is. It's very difficult for me to think well of critics, for example. <laughs> <laughs> I always think they have some scurrilous ulterior motive. And usually they do, of course. <laughs> Talk about Darwinism and its hold on the thinking of so many scientists, according to various studies, about 81 percent. It's like superglue. Are are atheists, and so, and some of them are truculent atheists. Some of simply that's just an operating um, uh, assumption. In your case, uh, where did you start out on this subject? And how did you arrive oh, man. at your present. It years. was a long time ago. I started out, believe it or not, in graduate school at Princeton when um, I was rooming with a very talented philosopher, long since dead, and we began talking about Darwin's theory of evolution. I said, explain this business to me. And he said, well, you see, there are random variations. In it. I said, wait a second. I don't understand that part. And ever since then, I've never understood that part, which is the whole. After that, I um, had a chance to talk about these issues with Noam Chomsky. And at the time, Noam Chomsky was vigorous in his denunciation of Darwin's theory. He's, at least with, with respect to me, he was vigorous in his denunciation of Darwin's theory. He thought it was preposterous. He's subsequently become much more guarded in his remarks, much more guarded, because he too has been punished for deviation. Even big names. Oh, even bigger. Karl Popper. He had to retract his remarks. So, so merciless was the onslaught against them. The Galileo yeah, of today. Yeah, I know. Um, nobody is immune to that, except people who don't count. Um, and the, he told me to get hold of Marco Schutzenberger in Paris. Marco Schutzenberger was a terrific mathematician, very, very significant member of the French Academy. And I spent time with Marco. We developed a very lasting friendship, and he was the overwhelming force persuading me that, man, this stuff is just gobbledygook. And he was withering in his contempt, just withering in his contempt. And we even went so far as to start a book together, which uh, was interrupted prematurely by the death of his son. We never got back together on it. 
But it, it was Schutzenberger that influenced me most significantly in thinking about all this. And then I continued to yak and babble all through the years about this subject. Did you start thinking early about the social consequences of this mindset? No, never, never. That was very late in my thinking. Uh, I've wondered about this because you're, I want to talk a bit about you personally. Your parents were early refugees from the Nazis. Yes, but they didn't go far enough. My parents fled Germany in 1932, but they only fled to France, which in retrospect was not the wisest decision possible. No. And then in, uh, after, after France fell, they fled again down to Marseille and then over the Pyrenees to uh, Spain and then from Spain to Cuba, to the United States. So they had a complicated life of exile, a complicated life of exile involving learning two new languages, among other things, French and English, because neither of my parents spoke a word of either language. So I have some understanding of what, this, uh, what the enormity of these events really signified, but I have to acknowledge it came late. What a, uh, I, of, of course, uh, well, it certainly came late for me uh, to, to balance two contradictory ideas in my own head and realize that they were finally in, in, that they were in, yeah. in, contra in contradiction. But but uh, I have, I am struck by the fact that the film Expelled has been denounced in at least uh, one quarter, maybe more. Uh, in the strangest topsy turvy way, oh, as, anti-Semitic, as anti-Semitic. Uh, as uh, which is it's mind-boggling, um, Alice in Wonderland sort of you, thing. You've got a Jew, Ben Stein, who's the narrator. You've got a Jew, me, in the film. You've got other Jews participating, and yet it's very easy for for the charge of anti-Semitism. They're showing they're, they're showing what the Nazis actually put out in propaganda. <clears throat> what an outrage! <laughs> to go back to the truth. And that, that is an objection. I mean, that is, that is a beautiful example of an ideologically objectionable and hence forbidden doctrine, that there may be a correlation, imagine that, between what Darwin said in 1859 and what the Nazis said a hundred, uh, less than 100 years later. And anyone who goes and reads The Sources, a very good book by a historian named Richard Weicker, From Darwin to Hitler, every one of his sources, German biologists, physicians, professors of hygiene, I have no idea what a professor of hygiene might have done in 19th century German, Germany, all of them say, well, I've read Darwin, I understand that human beings are accidents of creation, completely mistaken about that before, I understand that the law of life is competition to the death between species, and I therefore, therefore conclude that a similar law holds of human societies, it's competition to the death between races. You find this again and again and again. It's, it's, it's like a, a, a refrain that goes throughout the German biological establishment. Of course, there were figures who were appalled by all this. Of course, there were. That's, that's not to say this was a uniform point of view. And, of course, there was anti-Semitism long before. Well, and, of course, there was well racism before. long before. It's been the white noise but, which of is irrelevant. History. But we're, we're, it is very difficult to assign to the white noise of European history, 2,000, 3,000 years in the making, Causal powers over the specific events connected with the Holocaust. That's got to have more recent causal antecedents, and it does. Something of tremendous significance occurred in European society in the middle of the 19th century. Immense significance. For the first time, it became plausible, even rational, to think as Darwin did think of human beings as accidents. If you think of human beings as accidents, not connected to the divine in any way, if you're not tempted to say, what a work of art is man, how infinite in faculties, how infinite in faculties, then it becomes very, very easy to adopt a certain posture toward human beings. They're dispensable if they get in your way. And, and deep down, that is exactly how the Nazis and the communists thought. And they admitted it. This, this wasn't a secret among them. This is their worldview. And not only the Nazis, but the communists. There's a beautiful passage in um, Arthur Kessler's Doctors at Noon, which is a remarkable book, where the victim who's modeled after Bukharin, is interrogated by a former friend named Ivanov, intellectual, just like Bukharin. In the book, the victim is called Rubishov. And Rubishov says, what are we doing? We're killing millions of people. We never intended to do that. And Ivanov said, yeah, isn't it a wonderful thing? For the first time, we're experimenting with the human race. Millions die every year of dysentery and smallpox. Why shouldn't we kill millions in the name of a noble social experiment? Where did these ideas come from? Do you think these people read the Gospels? Is that their influence? Do you think the communists and the Nazis were avid Bible readers? At well, what well were they drawing their water? And uh, obviously the answer is there were several wells. 
this, this wasn't a uniquely caused phenomenon. Nobody is arguing that, but one of the wells happens to have the name of Darwin on it. There's no way to escape it. The straw man argument is posed by the Darwinists that uh, that, that is what the film is claiming, uh, that uh, there's a one-to-one -one relation correlation, uh, that somehow Darwin himself is responsible for the Holocaust, et cetera. But here's what I want to ask you. What is it in the thinking of Darwinists that is like the totalitarians in coming up with these straw men. In other words, you, you, it's a classic argument. Why do people fail these days to make distinctions that the because nuance is completely lost, because intentionally they're lost? Oh, I, I agree completely with you. These distinctions are very difficult, and you're absolutely right to suggest that Darwinian doctrine today, in the early 21st century, does represent a totalitarian temptation and thought. Because it is so willing, the people who are speaking on behalf of Darwinian doctrine are so willing to uh, marginalize and ostracize any form of dissent, religious or scientific. There is something totalitarian to the mindset of people who are actively engaged in propaganda. I mean, you ask yourself the rhetorical question of Richard Dawkins were to seize power together with Daniel Dennett as his henchman. How long before the firing squads would start? I would say five minutes. That's my guess. I, I, Chris Dawkins, Dawkins, too. Dawkins, Dawkins has uh, said, of course, that, that he is particularly offended by the idea that Darwinism has something to, had something to do with Nazi ideology because he, he himself does not support it. And he himself has said that, if, ironically or paradoxically, that... that uh, Darwin's theory, if applied socially, would, would, be be, would be fascism. But yet he supports all the, but what, what does that all, tell the, you? The, all the instruments that we have now. What does that tell you about the legitimacy of the inference from what Darwin said to what 60, 70 years later people who had read Darwin put into practice? I mean, Dawkins can see this clearly in the moment of lucidity. If we run a society along Darwinian principles, the result is going to be fascistic, or it's going to be Nazi-like, or it's going to be communist. In any case, it's going to be horrible. And yet, the breath that follows, he denies the inference he's already exposed, like a, twi a twitching nerve. He's clearly right. A society run on Darwinian principles would be like that. We know that from experience, because it was like that. And yet Dawkins is incapable of following through. Nobody else is capable of following through either, except for me, of course. Well, and then other people are not able to see that this does have any implications for Peter Singer and people like that oh, and today. How, how could you be aspect blind not to realize the continuity of experience as between programs for euthanasia, elimination of the handicap, murder of the helpless, and the doctrines that Peter Singer voluptuously embraces as being perfectly utilitarian and rational? They're continuous. I mean, nobody is particularly worried about Peter Singer because he himself is an inoffensive academic. He can't do any harm. It's what his ideas might suggest that will do the harm. How they would percolate down in, oh, yeah. in a vulgarized form to somebody else. They're not, uh, hardly any vulgarization is needed. They're plenty vulgar as they are. <laughs> Let's kill the helpless. A great idea, Pete. Begin with your mother. No, no, my mother. Do you see that fascinating story? No. My mother, yeah, he's got an elderly mother suffering from Alzheimer's. And the question was raised by the New York Times. Why don't you kind of aid her out? Put her under. No, no, no. That's an exception. My mother is the exception. I value her life. I'm not going to submit my mother to any kind of gro gross utilitarian calculus. We need a label for this pro this idea of put this shoe on the other foot. Self-delusion will do as well yeah, as any other. All right. All right. Oh, the, the French had a good word for it. What was it that Sartre was always babbling about? Mauvais foi. Which bad is faith. Bad faith. Bad faith. But look, I don't want to give you the impression that I feel that I'm exempt from any of this. I share the same vulnerabilities. I'm sure that I do. I just don't happen to see them, and that's the problem. Actually, you give your readers a great deal of confidence in you by dint of the fact that you acknowledge it. Uh, I always feel that way when someone expresses his own biases at the opening of a discussion. Maybe. I hope so. I hope so. I, I hope I'll be forgiven for overlooking the others. The book is The Devil's Delusion, and the uh, person who has probed that uh, delusion uh, brilliantly is Dr. David Berlinski. Uh, 